Upon reading the title of my talk, may, some of you may have gone mental health awareness again. Really? Perhaps because it is so oversaturated and overspoken on, on social media. And rightfully so, it is a very prevalent issue and that's why I'm talking about it. But before you guys all shut off your ears and reject what I'm about to say, let me tell you about how normalization of mental illnesses and mental health issues on social media have gone wrong and how we have gotten it wrong. In efforts to normalize mental, mental health issues and illnesses, we went to the other spectrum where we romanticize it. First, let me define romanticization. It is to deal with or describe in an idealized or unrealistic fashion to make something seem better or more appealing than it really is. So some of these buzzwords that, uh, that you can associate romanticization with is glorification, idealization, glamorizing. Social media has effectively romanticized mental illness. What started as a way for us to bring awareness and make people who are struggling with mental illnesses feel included, feel heard, and feel supported in their, journey, in, in their healing journey has turned into a driving force that enables uh, uh, disordered behavior and mental illnesses and deter people away from actually wanting to heal from it because it is presented as something positive, something quote unquote beautiful, glamorous, beautifully painful. But there's a difference, you know, between telling people that it is okay to have mental illnesses and that is not their fault, but still, but still helping them heal from it versus telling people that mental illnesses is something positive to have, that disordered behaviors is something that's beautiful to have. I'll mainly focus on two trends and aesthetics um, to make my point. So the first key example that I'm gonna use is the quote unquote sagyo aesthetic, and the second one will be this K-pop trend, Wonyongism. So first, let me, uh, uh, let me get into the sagyo aesthetic. So, so, the sa uh, so do you know what the sad girl aesthetic is? Basically, it is this, this trend of, uh, this trend of s sad girls um, pop popularized d in Tumblr between 2011 and 2014. This aesthetic includes listening mu to music from Lana Del Rey, Arctic Monkeys, Lord, characterized by traits such as black clothing, black, ba black backdrops, aesthetically crying videos, or even disturbing pictures of cuts made edit edited to make it look better. In some ways, many in some ways, posting this was an outlet for many of these people to share their struggles, their experiences, and to those who are feeling the same way. And by posting a lot of this, it effectively created a community of a sad girl. Because they couldn't find a community that supported them offline. And this is a good thing. I'm not downplaying the root issue. It's that they don't have a good support system. And therefore, seeking it in ways that are accessible to them via social media. So why was I drawn to this trope? It's, it's actually the same reason as everyone else. It's a, se a sense of community that it brought me, that drawn me to this community. No Notably, it was, it, was, it was at my lowest point in 2018 when I was actually drawn to this community. So an instance, I remember this instance that I was, was when my parents dropped me off at this very conservative religious camp. And in that place, they taught very many archaic and conservative and patriarchal teachings. This was when my mind was the most conflicted, full of contrasting thoughts surrounding my identity, surrounding my space in society as I was fed with many teachings. And the most appalling one that I remember even now is this quote unquote religious teaching that I was innate, innately less than a male and that I, was, that I had less potential. And they even went so far as to tell us that, you, that we could not reach enlightenment in Buddhism because we're just, females are just impure and less than due to menstruation? When I tried to question these teachings, I was shut down. I was shunned and scolded by everyone else at that camp. And they told me, you don't know because you're so young. 
You don't know because you're so privileged. This is not something that you should be questioning. You should not be questioning the monks. Standing out like a sore thumb because I was the youngest, because I was willing to, to, willing to, willing to reject these teachings, I felt the most isolated I've ever been. I was at this camp, isolated from my friends, and all I could turn to was this, this online community in, during my short breaks to use up my quota of free time and post, 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 share edgy quotes to, to express my thoughts as I was sorting them out in my head. It valued my voice when my voice was wholly disregarded in real life. So I actually went back to dig back some of these examples of posts that I posted back then. As you can see, it's a little bit cringy now that I look back at it, five years, six years down the line. But I understand why 12-year-old 12 12-year-old 12 Yongshu needed it. You think it's a good thing to no longer feel alone in these struggles. And it is. But it went to the extreme end where I do not want to leave this identity of a sad girl, a sad girl who makes weird edits on her phone with black background. I was scared of no longer belonging in this community. I got scared of no longer being able to relate to those in the community. But most of all, I was scared to leave this, let go of this quote unquote sadness because I wasn't sure what I was without it. So effectively, by trivializing and romanticizing this aesthetic of being a sad girl, it kind of trapped me into this identity that I was scared to let go of. It created a quote, quote unquote safe zone of being a, a where I could be a sad girl. But this comfort, quote unquote safe, was misleading. The word safe and comfort has positive connotations, right? So it should be a zone where I was happy and pleased with my mental health status, but I wasn't. So this contributed to my fear of healing. It made it harder for me to seek help. This leads me to the second trait, the, 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 the second trend that I would touch on in terms of romanticization of mental health. So I'll use the problem of body dysmorphia and eating disorder in relation to K-pop and K-culture. And as an example of this point, because it's a very common issue and easily romanticized and fueled by social media. At this point, it'd be like a broken record to talk about the unrealistic, unattainable, and unhealthy ideals to look like certain K-pop idols. So they're very beautiful, talented, gorgeous human beings, but notably, they're thin. And that's why there are trends such as the IU diet, which literally consists of just one apple, sweet potatoes, and a protein shake. How is that sustainable for a diet? But yet, many were willing to try it and follow it because they wanted to look like her. There are many trends and videos titled eating like I for a day, eating like I for a week. But the thing is, these idols, such as Ayu or Momo, had already openly discussed about how unhealthy their diets were. For instance, Momo expressed how she only ate ice, ice cubes for one whole week, and she was scared at night to sleep because she was scared that she, was, she would never wake up again. So these idols have re that blatantly rejected the, had, had re rejected the crash diets that they were, they, uh, they, that they were doing. So why are we still, why are we still upholding these diets and upholding their body images when it was not even attained in a healthy manner? I must, I must give credit where credit is due though. Many have come out to criticize the promotion of such unhealthy body standards. So you think that the problem would actually minimize, right? But no, it's actually very much prevalent and now packaged in an even more unassuming manner on mainstream media. The larger example is Wonyongism. It is so widespread and popular that there's a whole name for the movement, that there's a ism attached to it. So if you, go if, if you Google Wonyongism on any sort of post media platform, you'll see videos that rake up thousands and thousands of views of, of, of edits of her, of people wanting to act and live like her because th because she's idolized and people, her fans want to look like her and want to act like her, to attain traits like her, such as elegance. 
beauty, femininity, which are all positive traits. Be but before I move on, I'll quickly introduce you to Wen Yong. Wen Yong is uh, from a K-pop group called IVE, and she's a very, uh, she's the center of the group, and she's one of the most popular idol in recent times. One could even say that she is the face of the fourth generation of K-pop. So why is this trend more dangerous than the trends before? I'll, I'll explain you why. If you Google Wunyongism, if you, if, if you Google Wunyongism, you'll see this on Urban Dictionary. It refers to a trend of taking good care of yourself through skincare, exercise, and healthy eating habits. So it's seemingly positive, right? But yet, if you actually look and view those videos, it shows how people are eating 500 to 1,000 calories per day, and it, which, is not sustain, which, is, which is not enough to sustain a healthy body, and it's indicative of disordered eating. So it is basically disordered behaviors packaged in positive words, which makes it harder to tackle, and this is why it's more dangerous than the, diets, uh, than the previous diets. I've seen content, I've seen people try to con call out the content creators that make this type of content. And the content creators respond with lines such as, you're just jealous, shut up, this is how I want to live. You're just, you're just all hating on Wen Yong, etc. But the thing is, although they have the full right to live however they want, but by posting on social media, they're normalizing disordered behavior, normalizing mental illnesses by aestheticizing it. Not to mention that they themselves need they, they, they themselves need help to get out of this trap of, of, um, of living in a romanticized, dis living with romanticized disorder behaviors. All these disorder behaviors in terms of eating and lifestyle-wise reach the mainstream audience through the K-popification of it, through edits, aesthetic edits, posts, and reels of the most popular idols at the moment. Effectively, these behaviors are attached to the image of these idols. And that is why this, the, uh, why this whole thing reaches to many people, because these idols have many, many fans all over the world. But before you shame and blame KOL fans for falling for such seemingly obvious dangerous trends and lifestyle, take a step back and let's try to realize why they are, what are the underlying problems and unsaid mental issues that that they may have, inclining them to act this way. Firstly, it's not just recent. It's not just because of K-pop. Such perpetuations and normalization of disordered behaviors and eating has been promoted for decades now. So for instance, in the 1990s, a quote from a, very, from a popular supermodel went viral. Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And this quote, if you Google it, is basically everywhere. Such ideas have been propagated through iconic figures such as supermodels, actress, actresses, and idols for ages now. And messages have been bombarded from left, right, center, not just from social media, but in society as a whole. So I'll try to unpack from my perspective why people would fall for such traps. To be on completely honest, for a period of time, I thought this quote to myself, nothing tastes as good as skinny feel, for during the years I was struggling with disordered eating. I, I agreed with this quote. I thought to myself, yes, food may taste good right now, but I'll feel awful afterwards when I look at myself in the mirror or on the scale. I didn't fall for these crash diets and starvate and these basically borderline starvation diets because I was stupid. It was because these diets became alluring to me because I had my own sets of problem and a story behind why I fell into the trap of disordered eating. I was bullied for not being of a smaller flame frame back in Myanmar when I was in elementary school and middle school. Being left out and insulted by my peers, being name called Wama, which is basically pig in Burmese, or Feti Bo, which is basically, you're a fat person, or remarks from my relatives uh, telling me, you, sh you got fat since the last time I saw you. You should lose weight, which went on for years. And when I dramatically lost massive amount of weight over a period of two months, I was, I was met with praise for looking better, for looking healthier. And in school, peers stopped calling me fat. Coincidentally or not, I'm not sure even now, but I finally made friends in school. As such, their changing behavior and their positive comments enabled me to lose weight and stay thin. 
I felt pressured to stay thin because, because I was scared that I was going to lose this validation that I was receiving from them if I ever got fat again. But no matter how, how much I was starving myself, no matter how much weight I lost, I wasn't happy. I was starving myself to the point that I fainted twice because I was training and running on an empty stomach. It wasn't glamorous to be unhealthily that thin. It wasn't fun to miss out on tasty foods such as pizza or cakes because I had villainitis food. It wasn't fun to constantly feel out of breath because I simply didn't have enough energy. It wasn't fun to be constantly at the brink of collapsing and constantly hating myself every time I looked at myself in the mirror, every time I stepped on that, on that scale, that the weight, 43 kg, at my lowest was still not enough. None of that was fun. And I would only eat lunch during, I would only eat during lunch around my friends so that they won't get suspicious. I skipped breakfast, I skipped dinner. It was super damaging for 11 to a 12, 13 year old. As you can see, my point is, it wasn't social media or my, my stupidity that led me to fall, fall for these traps. Because it wasn't the root cause, but what the social media trends and the popularization and mainstreamization of, of uh, fat diets and romanticized disorder behavior was that it compelled me to, it, it compelled me and it preyed on people like me who are already struggling with other problems on their own to fall for these dangerous traps and to, to fall for disorder behaviors. As for, as for my final thoughts, the common denominator in both trends I spoke about today, sad girl aesthetic and wonyongism, is the act of perpetuating disorder behaviors and enabling mental illnesses to continue, compel, compelling people to live by and identify with these lifestyles to the point where seeking help or getting into the healing journeys becomes difficult. So in our move to talk more about mental illnesses, disorder eating, and to be more open about healthier lifestyle, where did we go wrong? And how can we be more cautious? To be frank, I don't have an answer because I'm still on my healing journey. I still go to therapy regularly, once a month, to deal with my, to deal with my eating habits and deal with my anxiety. So I don't have an answer for you. But my point is we have to be cautious when talking about mental illnesses. And in efforts to raise more awareness and normalizing it, we have to be careful not to step the very thin yet dangerous line of romanticization. Thank you.